Good afternoon, everyone. So nice to have all of you here with us, as well as uh, live streaming on EducationNation.com. I'd like to welcome you all to our Education Nation panel, stepping up the power of the parent advocate. As you all know, parents are often described as a child's first teacher, as well as their fiercest advocates. And while I think that we can all agree that every parent should play a vital role in their child's education, there are many opinions out there about the size and the scope of that role. We've assembled a great and very distinguished panel here to discuss a number of the issues around this topic. Let me introduce you to everyone. First, we have Janet Barisi here. She is the Oklahoma State Superintendent of Public Instruction. And early in her career, Barisi worked as a school speech pathologist. She subsequently became a dentist and a community activist. In 1996, Baresi also established Oklahoma's first charter school. And then a man we all know here in the New York City area, Dennis Walcott. Dennis was appointed chancellor of New York City schools this past April. And as chancellor, Dennis oversees a system of almost 1,700 schools with 1.1 million students. No small job there. Prior to his appointment as chancellor, he served as Mayor Bloomberg's deputy mayor for education and community development. And he began his career as a kindergarten teacher. So he's been through the whole system. Ben Austin, meanwhile, is executive director of Parent Revolution. He has dedicated much of his career to fighting to improve schools in California and has been actively involved in the recent parent trigger law debate in that state. It's going to be a part of our discussion, no doubt, today. Meanwhile, Brenda Martin is Kentucky's delegate to Mom Congress, a parenting magazine initiative to celebrate and connect moms fighting for better schools. Brenda is the vice president of the PTA at her daughter's school, and she also started the Parent Teacher Student Association at her son's high school. And then Peg Tyre, right next to her, is the author of The Trouble with Boys. I could tell you about that <laughs> with two boys of my own. And her newly released book is The Good School How Smart Parents Get Their Kids the Education They Deserve. She also spent two decades in journalism. And Phil Jackson, there you go, you guys, we'll, we'll plot at the end. Phil Jackson has served as chief of staff of the Chicago Public Schools, chief executive officer for the Chicago Housing Authority, chief of education for the city of Chicago, and founder and executive director of the Black Star Project, an organization that aims to eliminate the racial academic achievement gap through helping students and supporting parents, families, and communities. So you see, we have an incredible panel with us, and I apologize because the acoustics are somewhat difficult in this room. So you'll bear with me and I'll try to be as vocal and as loud as I can. And you will, at the end, have a chance to ask your questions as well. But I do want to begin right now with um, first starting the discussion, the difference between a good school and a failing school. As you know, it can often have a lot to do with parent involvement. With schools across the country facing more and more shortfalls in budgets and staffing, a lot of parents are stepping in, and in some districts, they're actually stepping up, and they're demanding more power when it comes to being able to institute change in failing schools. Lee Cowan has this report on some parents in California who are doing just that. Take a look. Parent revolution! Parent revolution! This is parent participation like you've never seen it before. They got here aboard the Parent Power Express, a busload full of parent pioneers traveling from San Diego to Sacramento to promote California's new parent trigger law. Let me hear you say parent trigger. Parent trigger. Students, let me the campaign you. was the brainchild of Ben Austin, the leader of a small group of organizers called Parent Revolution. It's not just a law, it's a right. He helped it's push a parent trigger. Right. A law that allows parents to oust teachers, principals, even shutter chronically failing schools, as long as 51% of the parents sign a petition to do so. It's simply about giving parents real power over the educational destiny of their own children. This power didn't come easily. That means giving mothers and fathers political leverage over school administrators and teachers, something that didn't go over too well. The backlash has been... Mind-blowing. The California Federation of Teachers even called it lynch mob legislation. Some said it was just a tool to advance the cause of charter schools. But the trigger law passed by just a single vote in the California legislature. Now, Texas and Mississippi have a similar law, and 22 other states are considering it. But it's a tough fight. The, the goal here is to transform our schools for our kids right now. He's helping you. Marlene Romero had waited long enough. 
I felt like my son wasn't at the level of learning he was supposed to be. He attended McKinley Elementary in Compton, California. One of the teachers told me, if I was you, I'll take my son out of the school. Less than half the kids were meeting state standards in math and reading. A perfect test case, it seemed, to see if pulling the trigger really worked. Did you get a sense they were trying to fix it? No. Never. So she helped get more than 60% of the parents to sign a petition to take over her son's school, to throw out the teachers and convert the campus into an independently run charter school instead. But when parents handed over the parent trigger petition, it landed straight in court. The school district challenged it based on technicalities on how the signatures were obtained. Other states are now watching to see just how this first test case turns out. But even if the California parents prevail in court, some critics say there's a larger problem with the parent trigger concept as a whole. It allows parents to take a one-time action to express their dissatisfaction, but there's no second phase. John Rogers with UCLA's Graduate School of Education says once the trigger is pulled, it's still up to the school district to implement the changes. Parents are cut out. But that's what that bus trip was all about, to organize parents to get beyond just signing that petition. As parent organizer Shirley Ford put it, this isn't just a new law, it's a new civil right. And not because of my zip code do my kids have to continue to fail and be a pipeline into the prison system. Amen. It's just that kind of passion that parent trigger laws hope to tap into. All right, it was a great, uh, great beginning of our discussion. We're going to delve into the parent trigger law in a moment because, as you saw, Ben has been actively, this is his movement that started it all. But right now, I do want to start with something that you wrote, Peg, in, in a recent op-ed in the New York Times in talking about parental engagement. You wrote, 30 years ago, parental engagement meant signing a report card once a quarter, attending the yearly parent-teacher conference, and making a batch of brownies for a bake sale. So let me open the floor up by asking each of you to briefly tell me in a sentence or two, what is the biggest change that you've observed in and how parents are changing their roles in the classroom and how is that changing what they're seeing in terms of results with their kids in the classrooms? you want to start us off? Certainly Janet? it's the power of the parents and that's what I found in Oklahoma City uh, almost 15 years ago. Wasn't happy with where my sons were going to be going to middle school so worked with some other parents and developed the state's first charter school subsequently founded a second one uh, nationally recognized now in the inner city. So it is amazing the group of parents together and uh, working on mm -hmm. one goal and one focus achieved. We worked with the Oklahoma City School District and then worked also to get legislation passed in the state legislature and moving forward. All right, and Dennis, here in the New York City public school areas, what are you seeing with parents and how involved they are and what changes? Well, I, I see a lot of changes in New York City. I see changes both at the school level where parents see either through their school leadership team and working with the principals and the teachers, are developing plans for the school, working and developing the comprehensive education plan for that particular school. On a district level, you have parents who are engaged in dealing with district-wide issues. And on a citywide basis, parents who are coming out to meetings to both raise their concerns issue challenges to the system itself, and also engaging with each other on how to better motivate other parents to become more active in it. And to me, what we talked about earlier as far as it's not just about one thing, it's about the multiple things that's going on within the schools I see happening right now in New York City and I imagine throughout the country. Ben, we see what you've been doing firsthand. <laughs> Tell me how this has grown. Sure, sure. Well, the, the, the parent trigger started in Los Angeles where the average parent or the average child has less than a 50% chance of graduating and about a 10% chance of sending their kid to college. And parents looked around, this all started about two years ago, and, and said to themselves, uh, there's nobody coming to our rescue. This isn't going to change unless we change it ourselves. That The system is fundamentally failing because it's not designed to succeed. That everybody cares about kids, but but the system is, is basically designed to serve the interests of grown-ups, of powerful adults. And so what the parent trigger movement is at its essence is parents saying, bake sales are fine, but it is not enough. We need power over the educational destiny of our own children. We are going to take it back now because we can't 
can't freeze dry our kids. They get older every year, and we need a great education for them right now. All right, we're going to get into that a little bit further in depth. But Brenda, tell me about what you're seeing as as you know a vocal activist when it comes to to parenting and reporting on the things that are happening. We have grown from being seen as the people who bake the cookies for the fundraisers to being the people who have broken the cookie cutter mold. And, and we have stepped out beyond into advocacy. So that's one thing we need to make people realize is that our power as parents go beyond just fundraisers. We are, are seen in the legislative rooms. We are writing letters to our senators, our, our legislators on a local and national level, and those things are important. And we're also speaking out against issues in our schools and trying to educate other parents and what issues are at stake and why we need their input. And we've gone beyond also being considered homeroom moms, which is a very important role. I've enjoyed it and been blessed to do it. But also we're mentoring now. We recognize that teachers need us as much as we need them. It's a partnership. So we're there mentoring and reading and science and, right. and working with the gifted ed organizations and, and special needs and some of the other uh, groups that definitely need our support. Okay. And, and Peg, you've written about this extensively in your new so book, just especially. just every bit of education reform right now in our country is predicated on the idea of school choice, that parents will choose the best school, the dollars will follow the child, good schools will thrive, bad schools will wither and die. But here's the fundamental problem that I see. How are we supposed to choose? How are we supposed to know what's a good school and what's a bad school? You see this time after time, low-income parents lining up for the lottery to get their child into college preparatory charter school, which turns out to be a sketchy operator and goes out of business two mm -hmm. years later. You see this in parents who send their children to the neighborhood school, even suburban, middle-class neighborhood schools, thinking their child is going to get a good education and that they're going to be part of the American dream and that that, those, that dream is denied. So I worry right now that we're asking a lot of parents, that we're basing yes. a lot on parent choice, and we're not giving them the information they need to actually make good decisions for their children. All right. And Phil, tell me about the biggest changes you're seeing parents, how engaged they are, and what is the direct result that you see as as. Well, 2011 has been the year of what they call the Arab Spring. Yes. 2011 must also become the year of the American parent fall, this fall. Now, parents must take over schools. Uh, I like what they're doing with the uh, uh, parent trigger. In Chicago, we had a group of parents at the Nettlehorse School. They literally took over the school. It was one of the worst schools in the city, and now it's one of the best in the city. In Chicago, we had a group of parents, the Whittier parents, Latino mothers, mm -hmm. who physically commandeered a school, and they took it over. They said, we will not give you back this school until you let us participate in the improvement of the school. Uh, America has lost its will to teach all of our children. That's really the, the big gorilla in the closet. Uh, we can do all this stuff with teachers and principal leadership, and we can have smaller class sizes. It won't make a difference unless we get parents engaged, unless we empower parents, unless parents take control of the education of their children. All right, I, I want to go back to Ben because you said something very interesting. You said the public school system it, is designed to fail, that what we have right now is designed to fail, and now you have dozens of states who are considering doing exactly what you instituted there in California with the parent trigger law. Question is then, are you giving up on the public school education? Is this an extreme way to bring about change? Now, this is the way to save our public schools, to make them relevant again, to make them serve the parents and community that they supposedly exist to, to, to serve. And so, you know, everybody... Well, what happened in McKinley Elementary School case? I mean, it still exists as is, right? Yeah. And you started a charter school. So everybody cares about kids. That, it's important to stipulate that. Everybody on all sides of this political spectrum cares about kids. But I, I'm a former member of the California State Board of Education. When I cast a vote 
I tried to vote, to cast every single vote thinking about my own daughters. I'm sure I wasn't perfect, but sometimes I made the teachers union angry when I voted for teacher accountability. Sometimes I made the charter school community angry when I voted to shut down the lowest performing charter schools in the state of California. But I voted as if every single vote would directly impact my own children. What I can tell you definitively, having sat in that seat, is that when the doors are closed, when reporters are not in the room like yourself, the subject of kids just doesn't come up very often. And so the fundamental theory of change behind Parent Trigger, the way to make public education serve the interest of children, not the interest of powerful adults, is to give power to the only people who only care about kids. Everyone cares about kids. Parents are the only ones who only care about kids. And what parents are doing around the Parent Trigger is unionizing. For all intents and purposes, it's card check for parents. They're not ever going to have all the power, but it allows them to sit at a table and be taken seriously for the first time in America. History. But then there's the issue of follow through, right? Making sure that once they're willing to take the board to task, that they have the right tools to establish success and peg. I think that's the part of the discussion that is con most of concern to you. So we give parents power, but where do they go? Where do you go to determine whether the new reading program at your child's elementary school is substandard or actually best practices? Where do you go? Where, do you, is there a website you can go to? Is there an unbiased source? There's a textbook company that will tell you it's a great textbook, but there's no real unbiased sources where parents can go and try and get good information. You know, we're unleashing a big power here on yeah. parents, and in, in a sense, I welcome it, but I worry, too, because I see that low-income families were, were destroyed by the sub-mortgage crisis. We, un, we, re we unregulated an industry, and we allowed them to pillage communities, mm -hmm. and I worry that the same thing might happen with uh, empowering parents without giving them appropriate information. What happens after you pull the trigger? What right. do you really want? That's what we heard in the piece. And, and let me add, according to uh, a parent in Time magazine, when discussing the parent trigger law, they said this is our chance not just to confront the problem but be a part of the solution. But on the other side of that, another parent advocate group said, well, this likely could cause more problems than it actually solves. Dennis, let me ask you, New York's public school system, do you think something like this parent trigger law, is it empowering for the schools or, or would it be essentially taking the power and undermining some of the confidence from the teachers and the public school system so here. let me approach this from a discussion point around accountability because I think accountability is a key word and accountability rests in a variety of different points. One is with parents and having parent accountability and making sure there's parent activity and involvement in the schools directly and know what's happening. But also you deal with leadership accountability as well and I think we have to talk about principal accountability as far as making sure that principal is doing her or his job properly and reaching the goals that we set for them and then teacher accountability. So to me it cuts across all levels of the school governance in dealing with both principal, teacher, and parent accountability. In New York City, we have a learning environment survey where we conduct probably the second largest survey in the entire country, second to the census, where we surveyed roughly 986,000 people, mm -hmm. including 465,000 parents on their viewpoints on how to make their school better. So we're looking for a variety of means to make sure parents are both involved in the system, but also have the ability of shaping the system as well, and that's part of the school leadership team and developing uh, the comprehensive education plans. In New York City, we're looking at the parent trigger and its implication as a statewide decision on what will take place, but our goal is to make sure there's sustainability as well. We just don't want a one-time thing that sounds good, and then there isn't a long-term plan attached to that. And we don't want to set our parents up to have something that doesn't deliver on, bottom line, student performance and making right. sure that all of our students are able to compete in today's society. So it's a unique balance that we're trying to play in making sure all levels of school governance play a role in making sure our students are succeeding. All right, we'll, we'll get to Jen in a second, but Ben, you want to just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just answer, answer that? Because it was raised in the piece, I just want to answer the sustainability issue. That, first of all, under the law itself, the right does not go away after the parents exercise it. When a new operator comes in to run that school, parents are still empowered to hold that new operator accountable, same way they held the old operator accountable. Similarly, on the ground, as this is being implemented, parents are taking this right seriously. They recognize that this is not magic fairy dust, that a signature isn't going to solve all of their problems. It requires deep organizing. It requires deep training. As Peg said, it requires deep education about what is the best strategy to transform their school for their children. At the end of the day, what this is, is a it's not just a new law, it's a new paradigm. It's a new way of thinking about education reform. That I think that
that part of the reason we're in this mess is that the spectrum of debate around our schools is broken. That it, for a regular parent, parents don't care really if they're in a charter school or a district school. Parents don't care what if, if the union or the reformer wins the soundbite of the day. What they care about is whether their kid is getting a great education. What they care about is whether their school and their school community are serving their needs and their children's right. needs. That's what this is about. It's about giving parents power over the right. educational destiny of their own children. And, and, and Janet, let me ask you, because the president of the American Federation of Teachers, Randy Weidengarten, has said that waiting until a school is failing is far too late in the process. So what is your take on the trigger law and and is there another solution that maybe is not such an extreme measure for parents to really advocate for the best best practice in their kids schools you know I've got to agree it is all about information that the parents are getting that's why our state legislature last year and our governor signed into law a new accountability system that has to do with a simple A through F grading system that uses multiple metrics of, of evaluation and reduces that down to a letter grade because before this, in Oklahoma, if I told you your child's school had a 1371 API, wouldn't mean a lot. But if I said your child's school earned a grade of C, and you that gave you an overall picture of how the school was performing, that gets a lot of community input. It gets a lot of parent input into wanting to be a part of that and wanting to work with school officials along those lines. So I'm a big advocate of parent choice. I think that's important. The parent is the first-line educator mm -hmm. for these children. Children, but it is about having information. All right, and, and uh, Phil, let me ask you because as we heard in the piece, I think there was a, a really well put sound by Shirley Ford. A mom said that she was very emotional. She said, "You know, my kid's success should not be determined by my zip code." And often, unfortunately, in areas, especially low income, where they have no choice, kids are going to public schools. It becomes the case. How do you bridge the divide there, and how can parents become more effective in making their school systems better? Well, you bridge it by investing in the parents. And when you look at what they call the global educational competition, is it that our schools are so much worse? Is it that our teachers are worse? Or is it that our parenting as a nation is not what it should be? And so when do we invest in what I call parent infrastructure. When do we start investing uh, in the parents themselves rather than simply only the teachers and the buildings and the superintendents? And that's one of the smallest budget items. And so I believe that the parents in the United States are just as smart as the parents in Canada and Finland and China, but our kids, they're, 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 they're not getting it. And the reason why is because we as a country we have abandoned uh, the idea that the parents are the most important person in a child's educational process. We give it lip service. At this conference today, everyone gave it the, the requisite lip service, or whatever that was. But now, when do we go out and actually start making it happen? When do we build institutions and structures? When do we start investing dollars in parenting? so that we can get the same returns that other countries are getting. So if you're on a block where your child is going to XYZ school, and XYZ school is failing, but if you live two blocks over, you've got a great school system, what do you do as a parent? And, and, and I appreciate the question. It's really not that simple. I come from Chicago, where 80% of the high schools are performing in the bottom quartile. So it's not simply on the block. Uh, what you do, you get involved as a parent. I believe that parents can learn. I believe that parents are the most dynamic force in, in education in America, but it's also one of the most underutilized. And by, in fact, parents have drank the Kool-Aid. Mm -hmm. Educators all over the country have given the parents the Kool-Aid that you don't matter, that you're not important, that we're the experts. And that is absolutely not the case. And so the first thing I would encourage parents to do Go up to your child's school. Sit in the classroom. You don't have to know as much as a teacher. You know your child, and that's what's really important. So taking that first step and a second step and then organizing. I, I appreciate the parent trigger people, and that's a great instrument, but we've got to organize at public schools, charter schools, Catholic schools, every school if we're going to make our country great again. Right, and, and Brenda, let me ask you, because I think a lot of that, very, very well said. 
A, lo a lot of times I think people believe that the American dream, sending your kids, getting a high school diploma, then going off to college, that is the American, it was the American dream. But have we lost our way somewhat with that? And, and is the public school system delivering in that regard or not? Are we putting too much responsibility on parents to try to, to change that? Yeah. Well, we have to accept that responsibility as parents, as well as uh, the teachers. They do need to be accountable for what they teach or, or don't teach. That's one of the things I like about the Common Core Standards. They give you uh, something to judge by on a, an even scale basis from K through 12 to see are our kids learning what they need to. Then we don't have to wait and find out that our children are dropping out. We have astounding dropout rates in this country, and we, we recognize that needs to change. Some experience 50 to 60 percent. All children should be expected to, to leave and, and be prepared to go on to college or some career ready using skills that they've developed along the way. So yes, we have to renew that focus and that commitment to it. And parent training is definitely an important part of that. I think what parents want is a, a real place at a table with real food. I think oftentimes yeah. when we are invited to the table, such as through the site-based decision-making committees that I've been on, and, and they're wonderful. But unfortunately, sometimes when we get ready to sink our teeth into a good steak, we find out there's artificial fruit at the table <laughs> and our votes don't go as far as they need to. So we need to make sure that there's real power. We need real legislature behind, uh, res behind our schools so that they get the resources that they need. We keep saying education is important. We keep saying that early education is, is crucial. Right. The achievement gaps are found to start long before our children even start school. So you know, we need to put money behind that. There's no reason why there should be states who aren't putting money in their early education. And, and Peg, so let me go back to, to what you've been talking about, and that really is how parents can bring about change, because the reality is they do need the right tools. You wrote, if we're going to give parents broader decision-making power, they need to become more sophisticated about schooling. So if parents are looking to pull the trigger in an extreme situation there with their school districts, or if they're looking to create a major overhaul of change, what is the parent training that they need? What is missing? I hate to sound cranky, but I don't want to be trained as a parent. I just want the information, okay? I right. just want to know what is a good reading program? What should my kid be doing in third grade? My kid's not reading in third grade. What do I do then? I want the basic information. I'm a good parent. I can help, and, and I suggest that most parents in America are good parents. We want our kids to do well. I want to know that the kindergarten, the first grade, the fifth grade, the ninth grade, if my child gets a B in that subject, that he or she is college material. Not that I'm a low-income parent and I find out uh, when they're a B student and in high school it turns out that they're at the bottom of the barrel of the SATs. I want my kids to, wherever I come from, to be college ready if they can do the work. Okay, I don't want a, a social program. I just want a, the information. I can make my own decisions and I suggest you can too. We want what's best for our kids, but how are we supposed to know? All the sources of information are what? Are the school district, which has already decided what their program is going to be, or the textbook companies. Where's the clearinghouse? Where's the FDA for education? Where's the unbiased sources? So we can figure out what's... I know my child. You know your child. So you can figure out what's right for your child. We don't even know what the options are. I've been on these conga line of parent tours going through the schools, and all the kids look look cute. All the classes look great. And you know what? Some of them are terrible. And mm -hmm. I'm an educated, long-term investigative reporter, and I can't tell the difference. So I, I pity the parents right now. No, okay. Go, uh, go ahead. You, uh, ben, well, Ben, real quick, and then we'll get right to... So, so I, I do no. think this raises a broader issue. Uh, so since some of the parents you saw in that setup piece, they recognize that this is a new right, and with that new right comes a new responsibility right. to educate themselves. That is not the problem. Parents are taking this seriously. This is their own children. Nobody has to lecture them about how important this is and what the consequences are. The bigger problem, to be honest, is these parents now are asking difficult questions that most people in this auditorium don't know the answer to. We just had a panel of some of the top governors in, in America. There is no, not, no one single governor could stand up and say, aha, I have the secret sauce to transform a failing school. What is the, the so so what parent trigger in some ways is bringing this issue to a head. Mm -hmm. There's never really been a discussion about a radical kids first agenda. What would you do if 
only kids mattered at this school. So these are tough questions that are being asked. Parents are asking them. Parents are taking this seriously. As Peg said, they are thirsty for this information. Right. Policymakers need to help parents to understand what are the best strategies to transform their failing schools. Okay. We know what best practices are. Finland tells their parents what best practices are and why their teachers adopt it. I'm not sure why we're not doing a similar thing. So we need thing a with national them. model. At or least have. best practices. It's about transparency. It's about accountability. Um, every district should have a dashboard report about how they're spending their money. It's also about how they're spending their money and how they're budgeting the money. It's about accountability, about how the district is doing. It is parents serving on school boards. It's parents running for the state legislature and getting involved in policy mm -hmm. and policy development through the state. And it's parents and just being in their classrooms, assisting their teachers, working with those teachers, working with principals, but always, always setting the bar high, high expectations, and checking those expectations. Dennis, you want to add to that? One of the key things is accessibility of information. And I was listening to what Peg was saying. To me, having information available for our parents on a constant basis in a variety of different means and in a variety of different places as well. I mean, in the developing of this panel, I wanted to make a conscious decision as the chancellor of the New York City school system to sit on this panel because it wants to, I want to signal to our parents, parents matter most. Making sure parents have the information, they have the opportunity to question me, having the opportunity to find the information, and also that accountability is there. And it's extremely important for accountability to be there, whether it's through parent trigger or not. To me, making sure that our schools are being held accountable as far as their grades on their reports, as far as parental involvement and what it actually means. In filling out the learning environment service, surveys, what it means. In New York City, we have 176 languages spoken in our school system. Making sure we're able to translate that information on a regular basis so that way parents have the information. So it's about information sharing, making sure people understand the information, and people having points of contact to go to to understand it even better. And that, to me, is making sure that our parents are totally engaged in the system. And Phil, you wanted to make a comment? Oh. We did something this year called the Million Father March, where we had one million fathers take their children to school across the country on the first day. And so I look at the schools that we had these mostly black children go to. The ACT said that only 4% of black students in the United States are college ready per the 2010 test score. 4%. So wow. wh what did I lead these children back to? Uh, almost a kind of slaughter. But I want to answer Peg's question because we do what she's asking for in Chicago. We run the largest parent university in the country, in Chicago, where we teach parents how to be great parents, giving them the information and references that they need, uh, the best practices. We run parent resource fairs. We do door-to-door -door parenting. We do father engagement. And so we work with parents all the time. And, and unfortunately, we don't do it with the support of the school system. Uh, this is what we know we have to do if we're going to change education in Chicago. And are you seeing results from those uh, We efforts? are seeing results. And, and we measure results a little bit differently. Yes, you've got to look at the, uh, at the academics and the performance, but you also look at the number of parents who are engaged, the number of parents who are starting to understand, the number of fathers who are becoming more involved with their children, not just at school, but on the weekends as well. We're seeing results. All right. I want to open it up to the floor because we have a lot of people who are dying to ask questions here. So I think um, there should be a mic stand right there in the middle. If you all can line up so that we can make sure we hear in this very acoustically challenged room. Um, and I know we also have uh, some I Voices, I Village uh, people here as well who can tell us what the chatter is online and ask their questions as well. I thank Go you. Ahead. Hello, can you hear? Yes. I thank you for this panel. I've been a parent advocate here in New York City for 13 years and a founding member of Parents Across America. And I, I don't think ever before in our nation's history have parent voices been more ignored than right now. Right now, our education agenda is being set from the top 
and focused almost exclusively on high-stakes testing, merit pay, and increased privatization. And I can tell you that parents from all over the country do not like these choices. The parent revolution gives us also limited choices in terms of wanting to close schools or turn them into charters or fire half Mm -hmm. their staff. What parents want, and this is borne out by the learning environment surveys in New York City and elsewhere, our number one choice is to see class sizes reduced and investment in the classroom. And yet in New York City, we've seen class sizes increase for four years in a row. So what we want is parents to be involved in the gr- from the ground up in devising solutions for our kids. We don't want a limited number of choices. Thousands of parents came out this year to protest the closings of their children's schools in New York City. Right. And what our mayor said is our parents aren't educated enough to know what's good for our kids. All right. Do you, and have, so a, there's do an you have a question yes. for our panelists so as well? So what I want to know is specific solutions or policies that any of you can propose that parents can have a voice in positive progressive change from the ground up and not simply a limited number of damaging prescriptions that are devi- being devised by people from the top down. Thank All you. Right. Uh, who wants to, to take that question on? Ben, you want to Go ahead. Uh, so, so a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, parents across America, nothing wrong with this, but they are funded entirely by the National Education Association. Uh, it is just is what it is. Um, but as it relates to the critique that was raised about parent trigger, you know, there are plenty of problems with parent trigger, parent empowerment, and education reform in general. We've talked about a lot of them here already. And plenty of problems, frankly, with parent revolution, that we've made mistakes, learned from them, been quite public about it, and are trying to get better. But, you know, it it doesn't help further the debate when we raise straw man arguments. So we raise the argument that parent trigger is about closing schools. I don't know about any of the parents in here, but I've never met one parent, let alone a majority of the parents at a school, who want to organize around closing their local neighborhood school. So, you know, let's talk about real issues, and there are real issues. So you said in the beginning, parent trigger is not some magical wand. Parents need power over the educational destiny of their own children. Most of the parents organizing in Los Angeles are not actually even organizing to turn the petitions in. They're organizing so people with power will pay attention to them. So people will take their calls and let them into the meetings when decisions are being made that affect their own kids and their own future. That's all. All right, let's take our next question. Go ahead. Hi. Hello. My name is Megan Lynch. I am the 2011 Mom Congress New Jersey representative, New Jersey delegate. Um, if you can my, speak up, Meg. Megan. Sorry, am I not close enough? Is that better? A little bit better? Um, my question I'm going to direct to the gentleman on, from Chicago. I am incredibly intrigued by the um, School for Parenting. I think it's a brilliant idea. I would love to know how you get your funding. Um, it's something that New Jersey could absolutely use. Um, we are having problems left and right with volunteerism. I'm sure this trickles into other other categories. I would love to know how do you get it paid? How do you get it paid? Uh, we, we have been blessed uh, that early on, maybe six, seven years ago, Toyota Motor Sales out of Torrance, California said, wow, this is a great idea. Help parents become better parents. And so every year since then, they've provided the, uh, the gist of the funding. But what we do We provide more than just classes for parents. Uh, We give them wraparound support. We give them uh, sometimes a shoulder to cry on, and we give them times to celebrate as well. Uh, But that's all a part of the parent university system. So it's underwritten. Basically, it's underwritten by It's it's underwritten by a private uh, uh, foundation, the Toyota Motor Sales in Torrance, California. They feel that getting our parents as informed as the parents in Japan is one of the key things that we can do. They feel that making our children globally competitive by working through parents is the way to go. And so, so do we. It's brilliant work. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did, Janet, did you have something to add to that? I have a program for that in the state of Oklahoma. It's called the Parents as Teachers Program. 
and it's funded both with state funding and then also with help from corporations and different foundations. Literally, trainers go into the parent homes and work with parents in poverty and at risk, usually teenage parents, and literally give them hands-on skill development. And not only parenting, but in being that front line, that first time educator for their child in the home. I think we have a tweet question next. So let me see if we can get that up right here. Um, okay, here we go from Dina and, and Nobly. How can busy working parents get the best unbiased information to help their kids? I think this goes back to Peg's question. Good luck with that. What do we do? <laughs> All right, Brenda, you want to help with that? Well, we can make use of a lot of the information that is a a available, and I don't believe it's so biased, but when you take a lot of information into account, you can weed out some of the biased portions. For example, our, your school should have a school report card, and that's a good place to go and look and see how your school is performing in subjects as well as uh, in parent involvement. And, and other resources, how your gifted students are faring, how your different minorities are faring. So you, it's good to get a feel for how your child, if they fit into some of those different categories, how they're doing and be able to compare them not only to their peers, but also to other schools in your county, in your state, and in the nation. Also, great schools is right. a great resource for that, to do that comparative type of study. So I, I recognize that she's concerned about that, but. We have to recognize there's a, a lot, lot of, of information, <laughs> yes, that we can share just through our schools that really won't cost us a lot of money. You mentioned zip code discrimination earlier to some extent. Uh, in Kentucky, we're like the 48th in terms of median income. Um, and, and unfortunately, where $53,000 might go to a white family, 35000 might go to an African American, and, and 35 or 36 to Hispanics. So there's a big gap. And, and unfortunately, when you look at some of the swap or uh, the benefits it's in terms of food stamps and WIC, the main people receiving those are, uh, are white families. They might receive 70 to 80 percent of it, while 17 percent is actually going to the minorities that have the largest poverty and the largest unemployment. And you might say, well, Brenda, what does all of that have to do with education? Well, I tell you a lot, because a lot of that poverty is affecting uh, the students who qualify for free lunch, and, and some of those people are not taking advantage of the uh, breakfast that are offered. And there are studies that show that when you don't receive the breakfast on a consistent you level, can't learn you, don't you don't do as well in math, your behavior is not as good, the, uh, uh, your attendance drops. So there's a big connection between our resources, between poverty, our nutrition, and, and how things are performing. So those are the things that we can do at our school level, just sharing information with parents, because I kind of think if they know this, they would try to do better. So we just have to take away the stigma of making them feel bad because they don't have as much as other people and make them realize the biggest gift and the biggest wealth that we can share with our children is helping them to appreciate education to the superlative degree. One of the things we're doing Go ahead, Dennis. is we try to get information out on a regular basis through the progress reports of the schools, making sure they have information about the schools, but also working with our community-based partners as well, making sure there are partnerships available both in the schools and outside the schools and sharing information. Then in New York City, we provided roughly around $80 million to create a position called our parent coordinators and making sure there are parent coordinators in all of our schools, uh, getting information out to the parents, to students on a regular basis as far as what's happening in their schools. Some do extremely well as far as getting the information out, but we're always looking for new ways to get information out to the parents. And I think the other key is how we use the new technology as well. Mm -hmm. And making sure not new technology that discriminates, but new technology that involves the parents in the process and making sure they're getting information on a constant basis. To me, information is power. Making sure right. parents have information from a variety of different mechanisms provides the opportunity for parents to learn more and more about what's happening in their school and also what's happening around their school as well. All right, let's get back because we've got a long line of people waiting to ask questions. Go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mona Davids. I am the president of the New York City Parents Union. And today we unveiled our parent trigger uh, proposal. We firmly believe that it takes parents teachers and community leaders to create great schools and that's why in our parent trigger proposal unlike California, Texas and Connecticut 
We call for the creation of school leadership councils where the parents, the teachers, and community leaders can come together and only choose two options, turnaround or transformation, because we don't believe shutting down schools or converting schools to a charter school, and I am a charter parent as well, but converting schools to a charter school, we don't believe that that helps to grow our communities. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, I'd also like to say this. I am a parent. Ms. Hameson, who spoke first, is a parent, and we run grassroots education organizations. And I find it very divisive, just as I see between the fights between district parents and charter parents, I found it very divisive of Mr. Orson, Mr. Orson to say, as Ms. Hameson was going back, oh, and she gets funding from the National Education Association. Who do you get funding from, sir? She is a public school parent. Are you a public school parent? The New York City Parents Union or Class Size Matters or any one of the many parent-led organizations that are out there, that are grassroots, that are in the schools, that are led by public school parents. Right. Don't always have access to the type of funding that you have from corporations, nor, nor do, do they push the same agenda as you. We uh, firmly all right. believe can I, can in I just parents, direct, can you... students, and educators, and communities coming together and It's a valid their point. Schools. Let's let Ben is, is there. Do you want to respond in, in any way to, to the allegations here? Uh, Obviously, it's a very controversial topic, and it's going to ignite a lot of passion on all sides. So, sure. now, I just uh, want to say there's nothing, you know, we cannot make it seem bad if an organization receives money from working families such as the unions. It's okay. You receive money from those organizations. Parents receive money from other organizations. As long as we work together right. to improve our children's education and ensure that every child in the United States of America so do you have has a access to a quality education so that our children can compete in the global economy, that's all what matters, and that's what we need to do. So we let's to try to work together. together and let's try to focus so that we have a lot of people who want to Absolutely. ask questions. Is there a question you have yes. directly so my related? Yes, question is for my chancellor. Do you support a parent trigger in New York City? I don't necessarily support it, but I'm not opposed to it. I mean, it's something to discuss. I believe in accountability. I believe in the school governance structure that we have in place. Obviously, with the mayor and the prior chancellor, we advocated for this position, and it's something I firmly believe in. I believe in an active role of parents involved in the process. I believe in the systems that we put in place. I always believe in evolving a system to make sure we're finding new mechanisms for parents to be involved in the process. But I do believe in governance where the mayor, the school's chancellor, and the principal are accountable for what happens in the school. But obviously, parents play an extremely important role in that process, and we do need to work collectively together. And I think we have that process here in New York, and I'm always looking to see how we grow it. So, but as far as a parent trigger, I'm not there yet, but it's not to say I'm always interested in finding more ways to make sure that our parents are fully engaged in the process and not just engaged in the process, but like Peg and others, making sure they have an active voice in that process as well. Uh, just really briefly, if you may, because we don't want it to all be about that. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so uh, our biggest funder is the Gates Foundation. Uh, we're proud of our, uh, the foundations that uh, back us. It's all on our website, parentrevolution.org. Uh, we are, there's nothing wrong with the funding from the teachers' union. In fact, there's nothing wrong with the teachers' union. I think the teachers, the former uh, president of the New York State Teachers' Union, now the president of AFT, uh, Randy Weingarten, has done some very progressive things, has negotiated contracts across America that I would want for my own daughters. Um, so the, the bottom line is we all need to come together. We know for a fact that we can do reform in a wall-to-wall -wall unionized environment. We also know for a fact that charter schools are not remotely scalable. And that's why parents in California are organizing to bargain. The fact that they have the charter option gives them more leverage because right. 
People who have power right now don't like it. It takes power from them. But all parents want is for their voices to be heard in a serious way, not a bake sale way, in a way that the teachers' union and the district bureaucracy's voices are heard as well. All right. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you so much. My name is Lucy, and I'm from Idaho. And I have a, a question that pegs on that. When I uh, started with my daughters in school, I wanted to make some meaningful changes in my elementary school, but I was told that what they really needed help with for was the carnival. And they didn't really need my help when it came to standards, curriculum, textbook adoption. And I'm in education policy, and I felt completely discouraged by that. So what can you say to parents who are like me, who want to do something besides fundraise to improve the quality of my public schools? I think, can I answer that? Keep asking questions. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. That's what I did. Um, I kind of met with the same type of resistance and continued to meet with people in the district. Got more and more parents together that were united in a front. And we went to the district and said, we know we have this law in this state that we didn't even have a charter law at the time. But we had one on deregulation and we said, we're going to be coming with a plan. Won't you sit down and talk with us? And we were persistent, and we didn't stop. We went to school board meetings and learned all about the business of running a school district as well as a school. We read. We studied state statute. We continued to work, asked questions, delved, went and got the information, and we didn't stop. And that's what I'm going to recommend to you. They'll always ask you to help with the school carnival, and that's important. But keep going at it, keep persisting, don't ever stop, because it's your child. Thank you. And, and Brenda, did you want to add really quickly? Go ahead. I just wanted to add that that's where your parent involvement gets more converted into parent engagement. That's where you're recognizing that something is not there that you need, and you can be the one to create it. So I recommend going through your parent-teacher association, PTA. We are not just about fundraising, it's parent advocacy also, and learning about the Common Core Standards. We're doing, uh, going to be doing some workshops in our area to help educate parents on that a bit more. So if you're not finding you're getting that support in your school, contact your district uh, officers or your uh, state officer and PTA or other organizations that interest you and, and let them know that, that you need some support in that regard. Yeah, we also, have a, in our state, there's I was going to say, we have, ten, we have about 10 minutes, so I, we have a lot of people lined up. I want to try to get to as much ground as we can, so thank you for that. Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. Dr. Alandra Washington, Deputy Director of Programs at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. My question is about building parent infrastructure across this country, and when you're doing that particular work um, around education, are you seeing other policies? that parent engagement is most important in, um, referring to transportation, housing, poverty, nutrition. So are there other areas that you're actually educating parents about? I think that's me. Phil, go ahead. Uh, yeah. In terms of building parent infrastructure, everything is interrelated. So it's not simply only uh, uh, how do we create better parents. It's how do, how do we create better families? How do we create better communities? And yes, it is related to economics, to housing, to transportation. So you don't do it by doing one thing. And this, this question of parent infrastructure, I believe that's going to be the question for the next 25 years. Right. If we're going to turn around education in America, we've got to create better parents. Can I just pick up on that for a hot second? Go because ahead, I think Dennis. it's all interconnected. I think the role of the parent and the role of the school system as far as what's happening for that child and those students is so key as far as the health of that student, the nutrition of that student, the learning habits of that student, and it's all interconnected into one because whether we have different viewpoints up here or not or in the audience, we're all interested in the same thing. How do we make sure our students are learning and learning as much as possible so that way they can compete in society? And it's all connected to nutrition, it's connected to healthy eating habits, it's connected to, connected to study habits. It's all part of one. And we have a responsibility not just in the school system, but to work with people outside of the school system to make sure they're part of that as well. And to have healthy debates about the issues. Along with healthy debates becomes a better system. And to me, when you have a better system, we have better results for our students. So it's all part of one. Right. Just one thing. Uh, we have thrown away the word parental involvement. It's a cliche. It means nothing nowadays. And so what we do, 
we create this thing called parent co-managers of their children's education. So we teach parents to be a co-manager along with the schools, along with the teachers, a decision maker in their children's educational lives, uh, like Peg. All right, very good. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is O. Cynthia Williams, and I'm a parent leader with an organizing group here called the Coalition for Educational Justice. Um, we work out of Brown University and along with the Annenberg Institute, and we've been creating campaigns to improve the quality of education for kids in low-income, high-needs communities right here in New York City. And right. we work with the Department of Education before, but for the last, I'll say, four or five years, it seems to have been a really hard um, challenge really getting the department to really listen to the ideas and the input um, of parents. And all we want to do really is to have a voice. We represent hundreds of thousands of parents in communities all around um, this city. And so my challenge, instead of a question to my chancellor, um, is that you please ha um, take it upon yourself to really listen and to work with our group and other parent groups around the city who really want to make a difference in the child's life. Our only motivation is to ensure that children get a quality and well-rounded education and that we come up with alternatives to closing schools that are devastating communities and parents and children and really think strategically and strongly of other um, avenues to improve those schools before they get to the closing point. So just in quick response, I mean, I met with, they're called CEJ for short. I met with CEJ, I guess around two weeks ago, where we sat around the table at the Department of Education to listen to a number of issues and the challenges that CEJ presented to me and to my staff. So there's always an ongoing dialogue. And one of the things that I talked about earlier as far as accessibility is concerned, uh, people know in this room and people who are not in this room that the door is always open. We may agree, we may disagree at times. But to me, the challenge is, is how we focus our energies together on our students. And that, to me, is the bottom line. So with what I announced last week around middle schools and really taking on middle schools in a very forthright way, a lot of that has to do as a result of CEJ and others having input. Now, the outcome of that as far as where we go may be the next part of the discussion, but it's always a role to play as far as the role of advocacy groups and others in partnering, and at the end of the day, we always have to understand there are times we may agree, times we may disagree, but at least with, that, with me, we have an opportunity to talk and dialogue around that. All right. Well, we're going to move on to the next. I'm sorry. That's, that's, uh, we've got three more minutes, and I want to get to a couple of, of more questions here. Go ahead, sir. Great. Yes, my name is Bill Jackson, and I'm the CEO of Great Schools. And my question is this. In, uh, for Chancellor Wolcott or others, uh, looking at data in New York City, the very best thing that can happen to a low-income child if they want to reach high levels of academic success is to have an immigrant, typically, parent, could be from East Africa, could be often Asian. If you look at the data, the level of support that's provided, the level of demand and prioritization of how families mm -hmm. spend time, and, they're equal, and the data suggests equally poor than other families. I've also taught in China, as well as the US. How do we learn, how do we tap into something that immigrants, so final point is that data show that the longer immigrant families are in the U.S., the worse their children do academically. What do we have right. to do from a cultural sense more broadly than, I understand the parent training programs that may be focused on the parents who, or the parents as teachers programs that could serve the parents who need the most help, but there is a broad-based cultural difference I experienced firsthand yes. as a teacher between the level of support and demand for excellence in this country versus some other countries. What's the solution? Very true. I mean, if you look at the statistics where the U.S. stands in math skills and reading skills, we are middle of the pack and we are a superpower. Who wants to address that? How do we change the parents' expectations at home culturally? You know, Natalie, Janet? A, a child that has experienced a failed education grows into being a parent that is operating from that point of reference. So it is getting back to teaching them the expectations that their child can achieve because maybe for them they've had a bad experience and they have low expectations for actually can, what can happen. 
and it is the value that we put on education in our country and our children's educational achievement. Um, I think that is a very important point. Parents need to put more of a premium on how children perform in the schools. Well, with that, uh, I think we're going to leave it there because obviously we could continue this discussion and it will continue on forever, fortunately. So we hope we all took something very valuable away from this. I want to thank our panelists, Janet Baresi, of course, Dennis Walcott, Chancellor of New York's Public Schools, Ben Austin, thank you. Also, Brenda Martin, thank you so much, Peg Tyre and uh, Phil Jackson. You all have been invaluable to our discussion today. Thank you very much.